And greetings to everyone on this weekly Sabbath day. Today we find ourselves in the month of February. Now February is different from other months in several ways. Can you think of any? How is February different from the other months? Well, February is the shortest month of the year. February is also the only month that does not have a fixed number of days. February usually has 28 days, but in leap years, of course, it has 29. Now, January, March, April, May, and June are all named after pagan gods. July and August were named after Roman emperors, who were also considered to be gods. September, October, November, and December are Latin names for the numbers of the month, although they shipped it a couple places the last time the calendar was changed. Although some argue that February is named for the god Fabruus, most sources claim that February came from the Roman festival of purification called Fabrua. I'd like to quote dictionary.com here. Quote, where did the, the, I'm sorry, where did the word February come from? Since other months like January are named after Roman gods, you'd be forgiven for thinking February was named after the Roman god Fabruus. But the word February comes from the Roman festival of purification called Fabrua during which people were ritually washed. In this case, the god was named after the festival, not the other way around. Must have been a pretty good festival. Close quote. Now, the biggest holiday in February is Valentine's Day on February 14th, of course. A day when we're supposed to do something special for the ones we love. But there are different types of love. The love I'm speaking of here is romantic love. Wink, wink. The holiday of Valentine's Day sees the greatest amount of spending except for Christmas. With Americans spending about $20 billion, that's with a B, $20 billion every year for Valentine's Day. Sales of flowers, boxes of candy, jewelry, and other related items skyrocket at this time of year. I know many of us don't get out a lot during the pandemic, but I doubt we've been able to avoid all the store displays promoting Valentine's Day. And television commercials also promote things we need to purchase for Valentine's Day. When I was a lot younger, I used to wonder, why do we all seem to be obligated to do certain things on specific dates throughout the year? Whether it's buying candy for trick-or-treaters at Halloween, presents for each other at Christmas, maybe chocolate bunnies or peeps in baskets at Easter, or flowers and candy on Valentine's Day, we're just expected to do these things. I know one young man who failed to buy anything for his new wife on Valentine's Day one year. How did that go? Well, not well. Not following these traditions I just mentioned can sometimes get us into trouble, particularly with our loved ones. It seems that society expects us to do certain things on certain days. But why? Who declared these things to be so? Where did these holidays come from? Although the word holiday comes from holy day, we won't find any of these holidays declared by God in his Bible. And of course, what about the traditions of Valentine's Day? Where did that little chubby baby with wings come from? And why is he wielding that bow and arrow? Who is St. Valentine? Is he the baby with the bow and arrow? I remember Valentine's Day when I was in grade school. I remember getting these little candy hearts with saying on them like, Things like, be my valentine. But what does it mean to be someone's valentine? I remember the boys in the class randomly drawing a piece of paper from a container. Now that container held, a, held, a slip of, held slips of paper with the names of girls in the class. The girl was in to become the valentine for the boy who drew her name. But I wondered, what does that mean? I mean, what was I supposed to do about it? I'm guessing our teacher didn't really understand what it meant for a boy and girl to be paired up like this on Valentine's Day. And if they had, I doubt they would have engaged in this ritual. Today, let's take a look at Valentine's Day and the origin of its customs. Let's go back to 496 A.D. In 496 A.D., Pope Galatius designated February 14th as St. Valentine's Day in honor of St. Valentine. He is known, of course, as the patron saint of lovers. Now, many people just accept that. That's all they need to know. However, this doesn't explain all the customs of Valentine's Day, such as that little character named Cupid. And is Cupid another name for Valentine? 
And why is, the, is Cupid depicted as an archer shooting an arrow at the heart? And why did some schools, at least in the past, place their girl's name in a container and have the boys draw a name to become their valentine? The actual customs associated with Valentine's Day began long before 496 A.D., when the Pope declared February 14th as St. Valentine's Day. How far back? We need to go back to ancient Rome, back to what the Romans called their Feast of Lupercalia. The following is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Quote, Lupercalia, ancient Roman festival that was conducted annually on February 15th, under the superintendence of a corporation of priests called Luperci. The origins of the festival are obscure, although the likely derivation of its name from lupus, Latin meaning wolf, has variously suggested connection with an ancient deity who protected herds from wolves and with a legendary she-wolf who nursed Romulus and Remus. As a fertility rite, the festival is also associated with the god Faunus. East Lupercalia began with a sacrifice by the Luperci of goats, and a dog, after which two of the Luperci were led to the altar. Their foreheads were touched with a bloody knife, and the blood was wiped off with wool dipped in blood. The ritual required that the two young men laugh. The sacrificial feast followed, after which the Luperci cut thongs from the skins of the sacrificial animals and ran in two bands around the Palatin Hill, striking with the thongs at any woman who came near them. A blow from the thong was supposed to render a woman fertile. In 494 CE, the Christian church under Pope Galatius I appropriated the form of the rite as the Feast of the Purification. End quote. We'll see shortly why this was called the Feast of Purification. The Lupercalia was a pagan fertility festival. Women presented themselves naked or nearly naked to be hit by the thongs wielded by the Luperci priests in hopes of becoming for fertile. On February 14th, the eve of the 15th, the names of the young women would be placed into a container. The young men would take turns drawing a name from that container. That's exactly what we did back in grade school. The young man and young lady, the one that he drew from the container, would be a couple for the Feast of Lupercalia, and often for the coming year. In modern terms, they would be each other's valentine. Now, what did that mean to the Romans at that time? To be more explicit, the couples were encouraged to be sexual partners during the festival and the coming year. If my fifth grade teacher, who also happened to be my aunt, by the way, had known that, I doubt she would have had us participate in this ritual. We mentioned that the Lupercalia was also connected to the god Faunus. For the Encyclopedia Mythica, regarding the god Faunus, quote, the god of wild nature and fertility, also regarded as the giver of oracles. He was later identified with the Greek Pan and also assumed some of Pan's characteristics, such as the horns and the hooves. As a protector of cattle, he is also referred to as Lupercus, he who wards off the wolf. One particular tradition tells that Faunus was the king of Lycium and the son of Picus. After his death, he was deified as Vatuus and a small cult formed around his person in the sacred forest of Tibur. On February 15, the founding date of his temple, his feast, the Lupercalia, was separated, uh, celebrated. Priests called the Luperci, wearing goatskins, walked through the streets of Rome and hit the spectators with belts made from goatskin. End quote. As I said, an important part of the Lupercalia was the pairing off of young couples to become sexual partners. To help ensure fertility, the Luperci, or the priest, would strike the women with the hides of the sacrificed goats. What were those strips of goat hide called? The ones used to strike the women? Any idea? Well, they were called Februa. This festival was sometimes called the Festival of the Februa, which is where the month of February gets its name. The festival of Lupercalia was primarily celebrated on the 15th of February, but the couples were actually determined on the eve of the 15th, in other words, the 14th day of February. That was the day when the couples, or valentines you might say, were selected by drawing their names at random, just like we did back in grade school. Let's get back to the deities that these early Romans were worshipping in the first place. 
whether the god or whether the Roman gods Lupercus, Faunus, or the Greek god Pan, you'll find that most of the gods and goddesses in the Bible and from mythology originated from a single false god and goddess. For example, we find the false god Baal in the Bible. Now, Baal is associated with Nimrod and Tammuz, also found in the Bible. All were sun gods. All were said to be born on the winter solstice when the sun was reborn. as it began to climb higher in the sky. In fact, most all of the ancient gods and goddesses got their start from one pagan god and one pagan goddess. So why so many different gods and goddesses? Well, for one thing, the actual name of the god or goddess varied with the culture. For example, take the so-called goddesses Diana and Artemis. While most will naturally assume these are two totally different goddesses, we find they're basically one and the same. Let's turn to Acts 19, verse 24. That's Acts chapter 19, verse 24. In the latter part of Acts chapter 19, we'll read about the goddess Diana of the Ephesians. It seems that the apostle Paul was preaching that Diana was a false goddess, and that idols made of her were, well, in fact, no god or goddesses at all. A silversmith named Demetrius was upset with Paul because he was afraid that Paul's proclamation would, might result in fewer purchases of his silver idols of Diana. The idols he was manufacturing, this was, after all, his livelihood, selling those statues of the goddess Diana. Let's look at Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. We see here that these silversmiths made quite a bit of money for the idols of Diana they made. That was their livelihood. It was very lucrative for them to make and sell these idols. They were getting rich, and they certainly didn't want Paul to ruin that for them. Verse 25. Whom he, Demetrius, called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know by this craft we have our wealth. Now, Demetrius got his fellow silversmiths together to warn them about Paul, that Paul was a threat to their prophets and to their goddess, Diana. Verse 26. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone in Ephesus, but also throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificent should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of great wrath, and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! The silversmiths promoted their statues to keep their profits rolling in. They didn't want the people to abandon their idols. They were getting rich selling idols of Diana. If we look up the name Diana in Acts 19 using Strong's Bible Dictionary, we find it's the word G735. The definition of Diana is as follows. Artemis, the name of a Grecian goddess borrowed by the Asiatics for one of their deities, end quote. The two goddesses, Diana of the Romans and Artemis of the Greeks, were the same goddess. The actual name used depended on the land or the culture. There were many other gods or goddesses, well, there are many goddesses actually using that name as well. Let's look back at Genesis 10, verse 8, if you would. Let's go back to Genesis, way back to Genesis 10, verse 8. It actually appears that most all the pagan gods and goddesses got their start from a single false god and goddess. Now, where did this begin? Genesis 10, verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before, or that should read against, the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter against the Lord. Legend has it that Nimrod married Semiramis. When Nimrod died, Queen Semiramis declared that Nimrod went to the sun where he became the sun god. Semiramis then declared herself to be the moon goddess. Well, after some time, Semiramis became pregnant. She declared that she had been impregnated by the rays of the sun, actually her husband, now the sun god. The resulting child was a son named Tammuz. Some will tell you Tammuz was simply the reincarnated Nimrod. But actually, 
since the people then uh, considered Nimrod to be their god, Tammuz became the son of God. Tammuz became the equivalent of Jesus Christ in the pagan world. This is yet another counterfeit from Satan, a substitute for the true Christ. At any rate, most all the pagan gods in mythology and in the Bible can be traced back to Nimrod or Tammuz. The goddesses, whether Diana, Artemis, Venus, Easter, or many others can be traced back to the single goddess, Semiramis. In the 21st century B.C., Queen Semiramis declared January 6th to be the birthday of her husband, Nimrod, the sun god. At the time, that was the date the sun was said to be reborn each year and began to give more light each day as it passed to winter solstice. Semiramis also declared that the birthday of Tammuz be celebrated on January 6th. After all, Nimrod and Tammuz were really just parts of the same deity. Let's say it's that counterfeit version of our Elohim today. Now, it was a custom of women in those days to present themselves for purification 40 days after giving birth. Remember, Pope Galatius I originally called this the Feast of the Purification. Forty days after January 6th, the birthday of, Th- birthday of Tammuz, and actually the birthday of most all the false gods at the time, is, you may have guessed it, February 15th, the date of the Lupercalia. The eve of which the 14th was, of course, when the couples were paired up for the festival. So what does this have to do with Valentine's Day? From History.com, quote, On February 14th, around the year 278 A.D., Valentine, a holy priest in Rome in the days of Emperor Claudius II, was executed. Under the rule of Claudius the Cruel, Rome was involved in many unpopular and bloodier campaigns. The emperor had to maintain a strong army, was having a difficult time getting soldiers to join his military leagues. Claudius believed that Roman men were unwilling to join the army because of their strong attachment to their wives and family. To get rid of the problem, Claudius banned all marriages and engagements in Rome. Valentine, realizing the injustice of the decree, defied Claudius and continued to perform marriages for young lovers in secret. When Valentine's actions were discovered, Claudius ordered that he be put to death. Valentine was arrested and dragged before the prefect of Rome, who condemned him to be beaten to death with clubs and have his head cut off. The sentence was carried out on February 14, on or about the year 270. Legend also has it that while in jail, St. Valentine left a farewell note to the jailer's daughter, who had become his friend, and signed it, From Your Valentine. For his great service, Valentine was named a saint after his death. In truth, the actual origin, origins and identity of St. Valentine are unclear. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, at least three different St. Valentines, all the martyrs, are mentioned in the early martyrologies under the date of 14 February. One was a priest in Rome, the second was a bishop in Interamna, Italy, and the third St. Valentine was a martyr in the Roman province of Africa. Legends vary on how the martyr's name became connected with romance. The date of his death may have become mingled with the Feast of Lupercalia, a pagan festival of love. On these occasions, the names of young women were placed in a box from which they were drawn by men as chance directed. In 496 A.D., Pope Galatius decided to put an end to the Feast of Lupercalia. He decided that February 14th be celebrated as St. Valentine's Day. Gradually, February 14th became a date for exchanging love messages, poems, and simple gifts such as flowers. End quote. It's unclear if St. Valentine was directly related to the 14th of February or if that date was just one that needed a saint. Regardless, the date of February 14th became a Christian holiday as we know now, it retained many of the customs of the Lupercalia. So where does this Cupid come in? You're probably familiar with Cupid as this winged, baby-like character seen shooting an arrow into a heart. Mythology tells us that Cupid is the son of the Roman goddess of love and beauty, Venus. As Cupid was the son of Venus in the Roman culture, the Phoenicians had Tammuz as the son of Semiramis in their culture. As we said before, same deities, just a different culture and language. 
Tammuz or Cupid, like his father Nimrod, was also a mighty hunter. And like Nimrod, he used a bow and arrow. Isn't that interesting? Well, additional research reveals that Tammuz was known as the Lord of Love and Fertility. Does that sound familiar? Remember, the Lupercalia was a fertility festival. You might compare that with the underlying theme of Valentine's Day today. Being shot by an arrow from Cupid, or Tammuz's bow, is analogous to being hit with a strip of animal hide, the Fabrua. Both are about fertility, of course. Roman mythology also tells us that one will have an uncontrollable desire if shot by Cupid's arrow. Drawing random names from a container to pair up couples as valentines, symbols of a false deity shooting arrows at hearts, in actuality these hearts represent a different part of the female anatomy. But allegedly causing them to have uncontrollable desires? These customs originated with the worship of false gods in early Rome, which in turn had their origins with Baal, Tammuz, and ultimately Nimrod. Just different cultures with different names and slightly different culture, uh, customs. Do we believe today that strips of a sacrificed animal hide will make a woman more fertile? Do we really believe that being shot by Cupid's arrow will cause us to have uncontrollable desires? Well, probably not. So why do so many people feel compelled to observe this day each year? Well, primarily, it's because of those who want to cash in on this tradition. Come each February, we're inundated with ads telling us we need to buy cards, flowers, etc. for Valentine's Day. Why? Because those who sell those things want to make money. They don't want these traditions to go away. They very actively promote Valentine's Day. Remember Demetrius? He was upset because Paul was exposing the goddess Diana as not really being a goddess at all. If the people believed Paul and stopped acknowledge, acknowledging Diana as a deity, this would cause a decline in Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen's profits. Sales of her idols would decrease. What did Demetrius do about it? He cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. In other words, he promoted Diana and in doing so sought to keep the people worshiping her. Well, if sellers of cards, candy, or flowers hear my sermon today, I can just hear them saying, This man has persuaded and turned away much people, saying, Don't buy all those heart shaped candies and flowers, and that Cupid be no God. Great is Valentine's Day. They surely don't want anyone abandoning, abandoning this ritual from the past. They, like Demetrius, want to keep the money coming in, in the form of candy, flowers, jewelry. And I just heard a commercial for some special pajamas for Valentine's Day. It's the exact same thing. As businesses proclaim or advertise elements of the Lupercalia, now known as Valentine's Day, to ensure that their businesses continue to profit, there's tr truly nothing new under the sun. So is there anything actually wrong with observing this day? A day with a winged pagan deity shooting arrows at our valentine? A day based more on sex and fertility than a simple and sincere expression of love? What does God have to say about adopting the customs of those who follow false gods as their own? Turn to Exodus 20 verse 3 with me, if you will. Exodus 20 verse 3. Are we to observe the traditions that honor pagan gods such as Cupid or Tammuz? The very first of the Ten Commandments found in Exodus 20 verse 3 reads, You shall have no other gods before me. So, who is Cupid? Who is Faunus, Pan, Lupercus, and Tammuz? Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 29 if you would. That's Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 29. As for following the traditions of the ancient Romans as they worshiped their pagan gods, should we follow their customs and their festivals? Should we look to what they did and do the same? Deuteronomy 12, verse 29. When the Lord your God shall cut off the nations from before you, will you go to possess them, and you succeed them, and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you not be snared by following them, and that they be destroyed from before you, and that you inquire not, after their gods, saying, How do these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. 
You shall not do unto the Lord your God, for every abomination to the Lord which he hates have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters have they burned in the fire to their gods. What, what things soever I command you, observe to do it. You shall not add to it, nor diminish from it. God tells us not to follow in the footsteps of those that follow their false gods. Gods like Nimrod, Tammuz, and Cupid. And not to follow pagan festivals, such as the Lupercalia, loosely celebrated today as Valentine's Day. Jeremiah 10, verse 2. Thus says the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen. The heathen, of course, are unbelievers, those that worship other false gods. So why do so many Christians today feel compelled to follow these pagan customs? Customs that clearly originated with the acknowledgement and worship of false gods. Customs were clearly commanded to avoid by God himself. Now, society, particularly by the way of advertising, puts pressure on us to do so. The advertisers make us feel guilty if we don't buy their flowers or jewelry or candy for our loved ones on Valentine's Day. We have in some ways become slaves to marketing pressure. In John 8, verse 32, you might recall Jesus tells us, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There could be much said about what Jesus proclaimed in John 8, verse 32, but many of us have become slaves to these traditions. Traditions that have no relationship to our Creator. In fact, relationships belonging to false gods whom we're told not to associate with. When I learned the origin of many of my traditions, such as Valentine's Day, that was actually a great relief for me. No longer was I a slave to these holidays, feeling compelled to buy certain things at certain times of the year, feeling obligated to do something special on a specific day to prove my love for someone. If one has to be reminded to demonstrate their love for someone just on certain days of the year, how impressive is that anyway? But is there anything wrong with expressing your love for someone or buying something from them? Maybe even flowers or candy? Or taking them out for a special evening? Not at all. And doing it as a voluntary expression of your love rather than being an obligation. An obligation originating with the worship of pagan deities and their associated fertility uh, festivals. Well, to me, at least that would seem to be much more meaningful and much more sincere. So far, we've been talking about expressing love to our spouses or perhaps a girlfriend or boyfriend. I think it's very important to note that if we wish to demonstrate our love for someone, we need to know what would actually make that person feel loved. Some could actually be allergic to flowers or even chocolate. But then if we know and truly love that person, we should know that we would know best how to please that person and express our love in a way that's meaningful to them. In other words, we should know our loved ones well enough to know what makes them feel loved and what doesn't. But what about our expression of our love to God? If it's important to express our love to others, isn't it also important to express our love to God? In fact, that's God's greatest commandment for us, to love Him. We can read about that in Mark 12 verse 30. If we know and truly love God, then we will want to know how He wants to be loved. Does He want flowers or chocolate? What would Jesus say if we ask Him how we should express our love for Him? In other words, how would Jesus want us to express our love to Him? John 14 verse 15, if you would. Let's turn to John 14 verse 15. Well, we don't, have to, we don't have to ask Jesus. He already gave us the answer to that question. Again, John 14, verse 15. Here Jesus tells us, simply, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Commandments that tell us to avoid following the customs of the pagans or unbelievers and keep the commandments of the one true God, including His holy days that so many have forsaken in favor of the pagan deities and customs that God detests. If we're Christians, shouldn't we be showing our love to God in the way that makes Him happy and not in the way that we know it doesn't? Let's sum up what we've seen today. 
The name of the month of February and Valentine's Day are associated with the Lupercalia, a pagan fertility festival. The thongs the Luperci priests used to strike women were called the Februa. The emphasis was on sex, and still today is on sex and fertility. You should have heard the ad about the pajamas. Anyway, that's where the idea of Cupid shooting the arrow into the heart came from. On February 14th, many years ago, the Romans paired up couples by drawing names randomly out of a container. Originally, this was for the purpose of encouraging this new couple to reproduce. Although few know the meaning and origin of this ritual, it's still performed today. There appear to be multiple legends of St. Valentine. It seems that St. Valentine's Day was used to Christianize the pagan festival of purification by declaring February 14th as St. Valentine's Day. Businesses today, just like Demetrius' silversmithing operation, continue to promote this day to keep their profits coming in. And we're pressured into following these traditions. But as Christ said, the truth will set you free. We need not feel, feel compelled or obligated to observe this day. Now, as simple as that sounds, few actually show their love for Christ by keeping his commandments. Most seem to prefer following the ways of the heathen and observing their days and their ways. But for those of us who have come to know and love our Creator, we know how Christ wants to be loved. Now, I was checking out a store a while back, checking out at a store. My only item was a bouquet of flowers. The young woman at the register asked me if it was my anniversary. I told her no. Your wife's birthday, maybe? No. And it wasn't Valentine's Day either. So she asked, what's the occasion? There is no occasion, I said. I just wanted to remind my wife that I love and care about her. If we only do this on special occasions when we're obligated, what about the rest of the year? Besides, how much more meaningful is it to express our love for someone when we're not obligated to do so? As I walked away with my flowers, the young lady at the register said in a slightly disgusted voice, My boyfriend never brings me anything unless it's Valentine's Day or my birthday. Well, I may not be very popular with her boyfriend. We could be led around by the world as they celebrate ancient pagan festivals dressed up to hide their original intentions. Or we can follow Christ. Let him set us free to follow his ways and his festivals that have real meaning and show our love to him in the way he wants. Not the way the world tells us we should. It's up to each of us to decide what our relationship will be to Christ, our loved ones, and our neighbors. Will we love Christ as He asks us? Will we love Christ as He asks us to do, or will we defer to the world's pagan ways? Well, it's up to each of us to decide.